I'm definitely interested in sleight of hand, but I would also like to talk about the verbal aspect of magic yeah. um, and how much you think that has an impact. What you say to the audience, how much does that have an impact on what you're able to do to impress them? It's, it's really huge. Um, you know, the things you say are what create the effect that they have in their mind. So the sleight of hand that you do is, is sort of what kind of makes that possible, but to kind of sculpt out what they think is happening, um, you need to be very verbally precise. And I've been noticing it in particular with uh, doing magic shows virtually, because language is one of the very few tools you have that can influence things that happen in their home. Um, but yeah. absolutely, uh, language is a huge part of it. Yeah, I've, I've, as I mentioned at, at the top, I, you've been doing shows virtually through Atlas Obscura, which people can watch mm -hmm. this week and next week, right? And maybe mm -hmm. beyond that, I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah, they're going to keep coming. Great. And and how does that compare to doing it in person? What are the big differences? I assume that it's mostly harder, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, it, it's harder except for the fact that I get to, you know, sit in my house and do a magic show rather than you know, getting on a train and, and going somewhere. Um, yeah. But yeah, in terms of being able to kind of make them feel like they interacted with what was happening, it, it's a real challenge. Um, but it's been really fun because I think people are super game to be watching magic. One of the biggest uh, things you have to try to do with a live show is just get them to want to experience a magic show and I've noticed that with the virtual stuff they just really want to believe that you know a magic trick can happen in that context so in that way it's been easier um yeah but kind of going back to the language thing the the slight lags and and hesitations in how you interact with people I definitely feel it because timing is such a important part of the magic stuff so so that's been interesting too yeah, I mean, we, uh, all of us in this show also perform or have performed in the Punter Dome, which is a, a live show where there's a big interaction with the crowd and, and the show as well. And it's, it is weird to perform with no feedback and no, like, you know, you don't see the way that people are picking it up. I assume you get to see a little bit of a, you know, people gasping and, and reacting, but a few seconds yeah. after the fact. Yeah, I do. I generally do the shows for a small group so that I can kind of interact with them. And, and um, sometimes people put things in the chat and, and, and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's been cool. It's more rare that I do things with, with tons and tons of people. Um, so there's definitely some feedback that you get. It's just a different kind of feedback. Yeah. I've have, um, has there been any uh, have you invented any tricks that depend on Zoom <laughs> or like the format, like that are for yeah. the medium? Yeah, you know, um, nothing that uses like computer effects or anything like that. But one of the things that's cool about doing magic on Zoom is that you get to control the, the frame and the perspective of what people are seeing. Um, so you get to do these sort of interesting optical illusions. Um, and I also got to uncover, uh, there's this 500 year old book that's about magic tricks that used math to make them work. And, um, and I do one of them in the show and it's fun because people basically follow the steps and then make a magic trick happen in their own home. Um, but uh, kind of going back to the precision thing to get people to follow instructions with a deck of cards is, is definitely tough. Um, yeah. I would think so. It is, it's hard to, to hold people's attention I, as in, in this format. But um, I, I guess the, the other thing is you're in, I've heard you're in, in Sleepy Hollow, which is pretty good. Uh, so you don't have to. I am. I'm in Sleepy Hollow now. And you can, I mean, this is, this is what's good about Zoom for shows like ours is you get to have you. And I mean, I guess you, you live in the city or you, you spend time in the city, so it wouldn't be impossible. But we have, you know, we're able yeah. to do this and for it to not be. Uh, for it to be easy for everyone, which is nice. Yeah, no, it's definitely one of the um, pluses. We, uh, I moved out of the city with my wife about um, five, six months ago. And uh, so it's cool to be in a, a famously creepy place on Halloween. Yeah. Um, bring it back to the word, uh, the word, the linguistic aspect of it. Are there 
um, favorite words in your field that people outside of your field don't know or use? Uh, I like phalanges, which is um, like uh, basically the part of your finger that is in between the knuckles. So like that's a phalan phalanx, that's a phalanx. Um, and I remember having to learn that early because they talk about that a lot in magic books. Um, and then this is more like slang, but the word flash, which is, you know, if you're, for example, if you're hiding a cube in your hand and you accidentally sort of a little of the blue, they see that it's in your hand, um, that's called flashing. Um, so I, I think that's kind of a cool one. And is that um, a, a screw up? Yeah, but it's, you know, specifically it means that they see, so here's where it gets interesting is uh, we have many different words for that kind of screw up. So uh, flashing is just that they see something, but then there are other terms for why that flashed. So for example, um, if you, if your hand kind of naturally has spaces between the fingers, and that is the reason why people are seeing the object. Uh, most people, if you close your hand, there's still uh, a gap and that's called a window. So if they see it through a window, that means that it flashed that way. But then there's also just the word leaking, which means there isn't necessarily a window, but you know, your hand is just not quite in alignment. Um, and so all leaks are flashes, but not all flashes are leaks. Um, we have a lot of different words for for those kinds of things. Um, is that meant to um, be able to talk about it without, I mean, I know, I assume there's a lot of secrecy when within the magic community and, and trying not to reveal things to people that, you know, that's the point. Um, are there a lot of terms used to, so that you can be able, so you can freely talk about it without giving things away? I think so. And honestly, I don't know if that's intentional or if it's just that magicians like to name things and just have lots of different titles and for things um, but it definitely allows you to to kind of quickly give feedback like you flashed on that um, yeah so but yeah I definitely think that the jargon kind of helps um, conceal the secret sometimes yeah is there are there uh, is there lingo that you are sick of using or think sh should be better yeah, um, so people in magic love to talk about uh, whether things are practical and also whether they are commercial. Like, could you do this, you know, at every show, 200 shows? Mm. Um, and especially the word practical to me is just sort of an insane word for a magician to be using because if you have decided that you want to do magic for a living, you've already kind of committed yourself to a career path that is not inherently practical so to get all kind of practical and utilitarian about it seems kind of nuts given the uh, profession yeah it i mean i feel like that goes for a lot of um the arts where people just like to set things into the categories of this will you make money doing this or is this more for passion and if you and a lot of people don't even care about the passion side which is unfortunate yeah is there something that doesn't have a name that should? Uh, so like I was saying, magicians love to title things, but there's this thing that happens uh, if you bring a deck of cards on an airplane where it warps in this kind of weird way that then produces a click if you bend the deck back and forth and it's different from the cards warping and everyone just calls it like the clicky deck. Like there's no <laughs> good name for, for what causes that. So no matter what, if you take a, a deck of cards on an airplane, it warps? Most of the time. Uh, the yeah. other thing that'll happen is like, if you if you put it out on your trade table, one of the cards will just kind of curve up that way. I, I don't know what it is. Um, permanent. Yeah, pretty permanently. It, it's really hard to remove. So, so that's the only thing I could think of that there's no name for. So do you not, you have to buy them wherever you go? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's... Interesting. Bicycle, get on it. What are you doing? Right? Um, on, guys. That's crazy. I didn't know about that. Uh, okay. And is there a favorite slang term that you or someone you know has coined? Yeah, I made up this phrase uh, with, to wine and dine. Um, when most of the time when magicians get together, 
uh, you know, you do a card trick, but you don't do all the pattern. You just sort of say, here, pick a card and do this. But sometimes it just feels good to have a person do the full presentation, right? Even if it's just two magicians hanging out. So I call that whining and dining. That's nice. I like that. Um, well, we've talked a lot about magic and what you can do. So, and you, you did uh, offer to do a trick for us. So I wonder if I can bring back the rest of the panelists to be impressed by no Levine. Absolutely. I would love to be impressed. <laughs> okay. Wait, are we getting a magic show? Impressive. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, everyone comfy? Yeah. Okay, Reasonably. Uh, so what I, more or less, what I thought would be fun would be to just do one kind of quick magic trick with a deck of cards. Um, but uh, rather than kind of whining and dining and doing all the patter, I'm going to just name the different moves and maneuvers as I do them. And sort of to your point, Nick, the jargon is so strong that I don't think it will get in the way of the effect at all. And um, basically what I'm gonna try to do is just go through the deck of cards and cut to the four aces um, without just spreading through them. And again, I'm gonna kind of use the, uh, the terminology. So we begin with a color steal and that allows oh. us to get the ace of spades, which is gonna go over here in the glass. And then we're going to do a pinky count, and I'm going to undercut a group of cards, and then I'm going to swivel cut a group of cards. And with a turnover, you can now see another uh, one. That's the ace of diamonds, and then an Ascanio turnover to put it back. Uh, and then to find the third one, we will do a um, we'll do a flip flap cut. I think this will work out. A flip flap cut. And that allows us to get the uh, the third one over here on the bottom. <laughs> and then we'll do a necktie glide. And then last but not least, we will do an in the hand slip cut, a kick cut. We'll put that back and uh, do a one handed cut. And then there's a move that I can't name because it's very politically incorrect. And we get the last card, uh, which is the uh, king of spades. There was one more phrase I, I forgot to mention that magicians use, which is, leading someone down the garden path. And so if you look over here, we have, uh, that's another king. <laughs> ah, that's another ah, king. Yes. And, uh, that's another ah, king. So I think we found it out. In the garden and, uh, path. And it. Yeah, so that, that worked out. Um, Understand. Thanks Go again off, for having me, having me do that. That was so great. That was fantastic. And all those, I, all those cuts are the real, those are the real names for the cuts? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, that, that alone was the trick to me, the way in which you separate. Because mm -hmm. I've been learning, I've been trying to learn for like 25 years how to just do like a bridge shuffle so that you can mm -hmm. do anything with the, like, <laughs> just, I don't. Which is wild because Allie's only 23 years old, which is really, even <laughs> really magic. I was going to mention that garden path sentences are also a thing in language, mm -hmm. which is sentences that seem to have like invite a, a very obvious ending and they're used we talked about this in a previous show in the in the times of live shows about semantic surprisal, which is where someone takes a garden path sentence and introduces an unlikely ending and it causes the brain to fire off in all these crazy ways because they were led down the garden path and then tricked at the end. So there you go. Yeah. You know who you find at the end of the garden path? No. Oh, Robert Plant.